this beautiful day. Thank you for the blessed mystery that is the resurrection of your beloved Son, the firstborn from the dead. Lord, as we contemplate these mysteries, I ask that these words of my mouth, these meditations, all of our hearts may be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. And once again, happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter. Oh my goodness. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. <laughs> What's wrong? The bunny didn't bring you any chocolates? So she asked her husband, 
And, and between the two of them, they decided they were going to bury the turtles again. They, they disturbed the turtles, it was still a little early in the year, so they decided to re-entomb the turtles in the corner of the yard, where they wouldn't be. And, and, and they did this, and, and time went by, and the couple was sitting at breakfast one day, and the woman looks over her newspaper of coffee and says to the husband, who's probably working on the sermon notes or something, I don't think the turtles made it. I said to my wife, said he, with far less confidence than he felt, of course they made it. Of course they made it. Anyway, he goes on to tell the story of how every year he has resurrection turtles in his yard. Did you catch the paper today? Did you catch the newspaper? Most newspapers have on the front cover some picture of some glorious church somewhere. You know, there's the big choir and the flowers and the altar with the fancy gold stuff, and Christians all over the world are celebrating Easter today. Celebrating Easter today. Celebrating the resurrection. Um, some Christians will celebrate in a couple of weeks, but, uh, but the larger body of the Christian church is celebrating the resurrection today. Um, there's music and there's song, there are family gatherings. Um, you know me by now. You know me. Just when everything's going along great, every time there's a silver lining, I'm lucky to find a cloud. So, so I, I, I'm inclined to ask of all these people celebrating the resurrection, what are they thinking? Do they believe the story of the man from back from the dead? Do they believe that God raised Jesus and really, really believe that? The church in Corinth, from our epistle lesson, uh, the church in Corinth apparently had no problem believing that God could raise Jesus. They just had a little bit of a problem believing it meant anything to them. They had a little problem believing that it, it, it had any effect on them. And I'm sure there are people like that today. In a world that's torn with war. In a world where a significant portion of the population is hungry. In a world where people are suffering, we don't have to look very far to find people suffering. In a world where increasingly we glorify violence, it would be easy to ask, maybe God did raise Jesus. What's in it for me? It's the night before Easter, and I guess this is a man after my own heart because he's working on his sermon the night before Sunday, and he's, he's burning the candle at both ends, and he's got a whole big stack of books, and he's trying to figure out what can I possibly say to people about resurrection? What can I possibly say? People have heard this story again and again. The story is 2,000 years old. What new thing can I bring to the story? And he's working through the night, and he finally falls asleep. He's dead tired, and he slumps over his books. Then he wakes up early in the morning, and, and I guess the Holy Spirit spoke to him. And, and he had something to say. He had something to say about it, and what he said, well, that's his congregation's problem. But the story goes on, and he's so excited about this, he's so thrilled, and all of a sudden it becomes real to him. All of a sudden this thing becomes real to him, and he thinks just maybe he can make it real to at least a few people in his congregation. He's getting ready to go to church, and he's all excited, he's putting on his jacket, and he's putting it, he's in a phone rings. And he is so excited about this, and he remembers that it's Easter. And as I started the service with, on Easter, you don't just say good morning. No, what do you say on Easter? You say, Happy Easter. Easter. Oh, Happy Easter. no. <laughs> Not quite. Not quite. No, Happy Easter is good. He said, he said, um, he happened to be, he happened to be uh, uh, Greek Orthodox. So he said, um, uh, Christos Anesti. Christos Anesti. Christ is risen. And the person on the other end of the phone, who happened to be a telemarketer, said, <laughs> Oh, really now? Yeah. Much of the world reacts that way. Yes, we have our beautiful Easter services, and, and, and yet there is this reaction, well, okay, God did that. God did that, but what's in it to us? What's in it for us? What does this mean today? It's the 21st century. There are still wars and rumors of wars. People are still dying. People are dying young. People are dying untimely deaths. There's still cruelty. What difference does it make? The account of the resurrection um, 
encouraged all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all have a Gospel. They all have an account of, of this resurrection. And what's interesting about this, and, and here I go again with this stuff, I just think it's a glorious paradox. Each account is different. Were, were you aware of that? If you read the Gospel account of, 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 of that first Easter morning, they were all different. For example, Matthew, Matthew records that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, you know, that other Mary, that's mom, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. And, and upon leaving the tomb, they encountered Jesus, um, they fell his feet and worshipped him. Luke writes that a bunch of anonymous women, a whole gang of anonymous women, along with an entourage, along with an entourage of Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and other women, go down to the tomb. And, and Jesus appears to two unnamed disciples on the road to Emmaus. And Mark, Mark, if we stick to the older, briefer ending, without the resurrection story that was later appended to it, there's no resurrection appearance. Simply an empty tomb. But now we come to John. Now we come to John, the text we read today, and, and, and John, if you recall, has Mary Magdalene singled out. Mary Magdalene's there all by herself, at least initially she is, she's all by herself. And John, John is the last gospel. We believe John was written about 90, 90 AD. 90 AD. So it's the last gospel to be written, most scholars agree. And, and John's probably aware, John's probably aware of the other gospels, at least to some extent. So there would have been plenty of time to look at the other ones and get his facts right. By the way, scholars have been arguing for a long time about this issue. Why is the council different? And the most usual explanation is what I call the traffic accident theory. The traffic accident theory works like this. You're driving along. You're driving along, you're minding your own business. Maybe you're minding your own business a little too much. You're minding your own business. And next thing you might know where this other car was not supposed to be. And you have. Well, we call these things accidents. Obviously, no one wants it to happen on purpose. It's not on your checklist. What do you want to do? Let's see, let's see. Uh, wash my socks, or the lawn, crash the car. No, of course it's, of course it's an accident. Of course, insurance companies call these things collisions. Because that's what they really are. So you had a collision. Unfortunately, it's not a real serious one. But the two cars look pretty ugly right now. It's all bent metal. It's, just, it's really ugly. And you're standing there, and the other guy's standing there. You and the other guy. And... You aren't too happy with each other. And you're both searching through your papers to get out the insurance cards, and one of you is on the phone to call up police so the police can verify the report and all this. So along comes a police officer. And the police officer talks to the first guy, and he's got a sort of, well, I look at him, he ran through the light, and then. And the police officer takes a look down there, interesting, thank you very much. And he walks up to the other person, and he talks to the other person, and says, well, what happened? Well, that guy over there, now we got two different stories. And they both sound pretty sincere. They both sound pretty shook up. And, and, and they both claim to tell the truth. So we'll ask a passerby. Ah, Norman! You're an honest man. Norman, what, 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 did you, what did you see? Where do you see these two guys? These two? Oh, that's very interesting. No, I don't have a bologna sandwich. Problem. So we'll ask Norman. And then we'll ask Barbara, who's coming down the other side of the street. And lo and behold, Barbara saw something else. And then I'll ask Alfreda. And I'll finish just way too smart for any of this to stomach involved all this stuff. And pretty soon, I got six different people I've asked and about nine different opinions. And, and that's kind of how it goes, isn't it? The traffic accident theory. And people account for that typically, well, it's not so much because somebody is lying, it's because we all see things from different vantage points, and we all remember things differently, and we all have different points of emphasis in our mind. After all, if you're driving one of the cars that's in a collision, you have a unique perspective. As does the driver of the other car. As does the person who had to kind of duck out of the way so a pub cap would them. Well, scholars have suggested the reason the Gospels are different is because all these men saw things a little differently. They saw things a little differently. And you're all about it. Yeah, that makes sense. And here I go again. You know what I think of that theory? It's balderdash. It's a ridiculous theory. It's absolutely ridiculous. But if we're talking about any other kind of human situation, maybe it makes sense. But we are, after 
Paul talking about the word of God. And, and I like to believe that God always has a purpose. And the people that God chooses, the people that God chooses, always have a purpose. So here's John. And this is 90 AD. The better part of a lifetime has gone by since the events that we're celebrating today. And I think John was pretty aware of the other Gospels. John was pretty aware of what was being said. In fact, John was so aware of it and so aware of the condition of the church, I believe that John began to reason to himself. A lifetime has gone by since these events took place. There are very few left who are alive who even saw them. And there are one or two things that are going to happen. One, the last of the people who really knew Jesus personally, the last of the people who saw the teacher, this is going to pass into the obscurity of history. This is going to disappear. That's one possibility. The second possibility is even worse. People are going to turn this into a religion. People are going to sacralize this. People are going to make this into one more myth. Do you have any idea how many Eastern myths there are about gods who die and rise? That's probably one of the most common myths in, in, in Eastern religion. The dying and rising God. And, and I think John says to himself, God forbid. God forbid. Jesus did not come to start another religion. Heaven knows we have enough religions. Jesus came to transform our hearts. Jesus came to show us there's something better than living for me first. Jesus came to show us that there is a way of life that doesn't lead down to the pit. Jesus came to show us that there is a kind of life that's not about so I think when John looked at this story, John said to himself, what's important? Because we weren't there. And another generation, nobody's going to be around who was there. What's important is we find a way to see ourselves in this story. So I think that when we're looking at this fourth gospel, more than anything, we're looking at a sermon. More than anything, we're looking at at John's attempt to share the realities. The first person we meet in this is, is Mary. Now, now, John has some inkling that Mary was there. John has some inkling that Mary Magdalene was very important to Jesus. In fact, by the time, by the time John was writing this gospel, Mary Magdalene had increased in her importance. So much so that there was an entire cult, if you will, being built around her. There are those who say that Mary Magdalene was the founder of the Gnostic movement. And certainly Mary Magdalene was sometimes, at that point, known as Apostoli Apostoliorum. Say what? Apostoli Apostoliorum. Apostle to the Apostles. Mary Magdalene had grown incredibly in importance. How accurate that is, how historical that is, I, I um, I'd be waiting in the waters way over my head if I tried to figure that out. But there is something that John knew. There is a fact that had been rumored and continues to be rumored. It is sometimes the stuff of movies, most of which turn my stomach. There is a fact. Mary Magdalene loved Jesus. Now, you can make of that what you will, and it is not my intention to apply anything more than we already know from the text. Some people suggest that was a romantic relationship. Some people suggest that was a sexual relationship. And I'm not going to go any farther than the text goes. But the text makes it very clear that Mary Magdalene loved Jesus. And Jesus loved Mary Magdalene as much as Jesus loves you. And Jesus loves you. So I think in John's exposition, the very first person we meet, Mary Magdalene, she is all of those who love Jesus. She is every single person who grew up with the understanding, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. She is every single young person who invited Christ to Jesus 
Please, Jesus, forgive me for that white lie I told my mother. Mary Magdalene is every single old person who recognizes that they have more days behind them than they have ahead of them and says, Jesus, I'm coming home to you soon. Mary Magdalene is every person who loves Jesus, loves Jesus dearly, passionately, wants nothing more than to see Jesus. That's Mary Magdalene. She wants desperately to see Jesus. She's broken up inside and thought that he's gone. So she goes looking for Jesus. Mary wants to see Jesus. So she goes looking for Jesus. And she can't find him. And that's act one, ladies and gentlemen. Mary is every person who wants to see Jesus, who loves Jesus, and can't find him. How many people today are looking for Jesus? How many people go to church today looking for Jesus and they can't find Jesus? How many people are looking for Jesus in our society, in our churches, in our culture, and we cannot find Jesus? Where is Jesus? Today, is Jesus hidden behind the Easter Bunny? Is Jesus hidden behind the colored eggs? Is Jesus hidden behind the fancy family dinners? Where is Jesus? Already in the first century, people were hiding Jesus. People were hiding Jesus under their kids' life. People were hiding Jesus under their philosophy. People were hiding him. Jesus. So Mary does what any person who loves Jesus would do. We're told she immediately goes running back to her pastor. Well, well not exactly, but, but you know, she goes back to, 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 and she tells Peter and the other guy, the other guy who is the witness that becomes the Gospel of John, the other guy, the disciple whom, whom Jesus loves, the other guy, Peter and the other guy immediately get into a race. They have a race. Well, well, look at the text. It says they start running. They start running. They start running along. They're neck and neck. You must imagine this. And they're off. It's Peter and the other guy. The other guy and Peter. Peter and the other guy. Peter and the other guy. It's Peter ahead by a leader. The other guy ahead by a sandal. And it's, and it's, it's a full finish. It's the other guy. The other guy makes it first. The other guy makes it first. And there they are. What do they do? The other guy goes peeking into the tomb. He goes peeking. Goes, well, that's a grave. I'm not going in there. He goes peeking and he sees. Sure enough, it's empty. In fact, the linens are so neatly folded. Jesus' mama raised him right. You know, give me this back. I mean, come on. The linens are neatly folded. Even the head covering is put away separate. Imagine Jesus saying, well, I don't need this stuff. I might as well just uh, fold it up maybe to somebody else. But Peter. Peter finally catches up. And what does he do? He pushes ahead of the other guy. He goes right inside. Isn't that just like Peter? I'm going to walk out of water. Oh, man, I'm, I'm going to walk out of water. Splish. Yeah, that's Peter. He goes right inside. And when the other guy sees Peter inside... We're told he goes inside and he believes. He goes inside and he believes. I'm, I'm not sure what John's trying to get out there. Does that mean that the other guy believes and Peter's still skeptical? Maybe. Well, these two guys are in there. And what do they do? They look at it. They examine the evidence. Look at this. I wonder what, what is this about? And our text says they go on home. Just like then. They go on home, they're playing a theodicy game. <laughs> they go on home, they're discussing theology. Do you believe it? I always imagine the men in those days having these wonderful, wonderful beards. Kind of like Al went a lot longer. Wonderful beards that get stroked as they're thinking. Yeah. What do you think, Peter? I don't know. Could it be? And uh, Mary, 
Greek contests. You know, and who, who, can, who can parse out a, you know, oh, it's just horrible. We're, we're all about that. We're all about the intellectual. We're all about the new discovery. We're all about the new see John's writing of this serves the very same purpose today as it did then. The question for us, Jesus' brothers and Jesus' sisters, Jesus' family, Jesus is the firstborn from the dead and he makes us his family, his immortal family. What will we do with this? What will we do with this? We can do as perhaps much of the Christian church has, and we can hold on to Jesus. We can sacralize Jesus. We can put Jesus up on the shelf. We can put candles in front of Jesus. We can put Jesus in a gold frame.
or better yet, better yet.